Welcome, welcome. We're back at it here on this Monday. It is September the 15th. This is Hurricane Hub Live. I'm Chief Meteorologist Tim Pandages. We are smack dab in the middle of September. Still without a name storm so far this month. Very unusual. It's been since the 28th of August that we had our last name system. Fair none, the last advisory issued on August the 28th. Now tonight on HHL, we're talking about Gabrielle. Highly probable we see a Gabrielle developing this week. Chances are now up to 90%. I know what you're thinking. We've seen this before. Yeah, this has been tagged Invest 92L. About a week and a half ago, we had Invest 91L. Very similar outlook. And then it never developed. This go round, atmospheric conditions are just a little bit more favorable that I think we do get a name storm out of this. And then in the Eastern Pacific, we've got uh, Mario that's still cooking out there. After kind of falling apart briefly, it reemerged and redeveloped. So we still have Mario out there. And Narda is up next. 14th name storm of the season in the Eastern Pacific Basin. And it looks like that'll develop. That's got a high chance of developing as well. So just a quick refresher on invest, what those mean. This is invest 92L out there right now. Invest stands for investigative area. Uh, 92 is just a record number. It rotates from 90 to 99. So we already went through that uh, cycle once. So we're back at 92. And L means it's a in the Atlantic Basin. That's a basin indicator. So invest 92L out in the Atlantic Basin. Now, of course, we just passed the peak five days ago, which is September the 10th. And here we are coming back down from the peak of the season, but still September overall, still a very, very active month. And even for the first half of October, very, very active as well. And it's looking more likely we see a backloaded season considering we've only had six named storms so far this season. Five tropical storms, one hurricane. We're behind climatology a little bit, but I bet we see the second half of the month get much more active here. And the uh, kind of theme of the season so far has been the recurvature out to sea. Good news. Only had one big hurricane. That was Aaron. And that stayed well offshore, thankfully. And most of the other storms have done the same thing. We did have, um, I, I forget what the, na the sea name storm was that made landfall there. It's just escaping me right now. And then we did have Beria that made landfall in Mexico uh, earlier in this season. But, of course, not much since. All right, the Atlantic Basin here, you can see, this is 92L, very large tropical wave, okay? And it's starting to get that look that it's getting its act together and organizing. So earlier today, they did put a tag on it, invest 92L. Basically, what that allows us to do is not only keep track of it, but also now get the computer models to start running solutions on it so we can get the spaghetti plots and get a better outlook here on what may happen with this system in the future. 60% odds is of the 8 o'clock outlook from the Hurricane Center in the short term, so in the next 48 hours, but within the next Next week, we're up to 90% chances here. And you can see it's definitely looking a little bit better uh, than, say, what 91L did um, about 10 days ago. Infrared satellite imagery here shows a very large system sprawling across a good chunk of the main development region. Visible satellite imagery here, of course, we lose the sunlight, so we lose the imagery here. But you can see when it's up, we are getting that broad rotation there. It still has a little ways to go before we'll get that defined center of circulation. Uh, but I think we do get there. We also have a lack of a lot of dry air. That was the bigger problem with 91L about a 10 days ago. It was pretty much completely surrounded by very dry air. Saharan dust was getting entrained into it. We still have some to the north here. That rust color is going to be some dust and dry air in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. But overall, very moist uh, envelope here all around um, 92L at this time. And even out to the west, out ahead of it, some dry air, but not as much as there was. So here are the plots we're getting on it. Uh, hurricane model plots here. It does take a jog to the north here, probably in the next 24 hours. We're going out seven days, so to next Monday at 8 p.m. And by that point in time, pretty good model consensus here, taking it to the north and west. And then there's Bermuda right there. A week from now, we could have it just southeast of Bermuda at that point in time. Does not look to be a threat to the U.S. East Coast at this point in time. But of course, things can change as the storm system evolves. But this is the first suite of model runs on this. Now when we throw in the ensembles, which is going to be the GFS and the European, run several different times, tweaking the variables a bit. We get a larger spread on that solution there. And you can see here, pretty good consensus, taking that, that drive to the north and then a northwest trajectory. But then divergence here in the long range, going out uh, again seven days. And there is a clear cluster that takes it farther west and then turns it north. Similar to a track that would have been Aaron. And then we've got another cluster of them that takes it out to sea and recurves it out. So we'll have to watch it. I mean, you can't say anything this far out as a definite. So we'll watch it closely as it evolves over the next 7 to 10 days. The um, 
operational runs of the GFS and the European. Here, you're going to see the GFS show up in the yellow, uh, the European in the red here. We've got to go out a couple days before we start to see any real models locking on it. So here we are by Friday. Five days from now, we start to see the European and the GFS both signaling a close center of circulation and a low center, a low pressure system developing. A couple more days before it really starts to get its act going by next Tuesday. We're out over we're out eight days now, and the European is in, indicating maybe a, a weaker system, meaning a farther west track. GFS is a much stronger system, again, situated just to the east southeast of Bermuda by that point in time, but similar timing wise. And then go out another couple of days and we see them both doing the recurving out to see uh, European threatening Bermuda a little bit more uh, than what the GFS would be, but both showing a larger system 10 days out from now on the 25th of September. All right, over in the eastern Pacific Basin, we've got Mario still spinning here as a tropical storm and another area of interest here that will likely become Narda. That's up to a 70 percent chance of developing. A look at Mario's development or Mario's track here. It's at a 65 mile per hour tropical storm. Uh, it's going to be on a weakening trend here as it lifts off to the northwest, again, staying offshore, uh, not impacting anybody. Again, the next name on the list is going to be Narda, which would be the 13th uh, named storm of the season. So been very, very active out in the eastern Pacific Basin. All right, coming up after a quick break, we've got part five of Hurricane Floyd. The anniversary of its landfall comes tomorrow on the 16th at Cape Fear, North Carolina. So we've got a couple more parts to share with you. And then later on, we've got tropical trivia as well. So stick around. Welcome back to Hurricane Hub Live. As our weather team continues to keep a close eye on the tropics, we're breaking down some of the details behind how hurricanes are monitored. In tonight's Hurricane Fast Fact, meteorologist Hunter Forst explains how hurricane winds are measured. To get the maximum sustained winds, the National Hurricane Center measures wind 10 meters or 33 feet off the ground, and it's averaged over one minute. Different sensors and techniques are used depending on where the measurement is being taken. For instance, tropical storms and hurricanes that are far out to sea are primarily monitored by satellites. Sensors on the satellites and analysis of images can produce some pretty accurate estimates of the wind speed and central pressure of the storms. As it moves closer and becomes a threat to land, vital and more precise data is gathered by the hurricane hunters. The planes release instruments called drop sounds to measure the winds as they fall to the ocean. The hurricane hunters are also equipped with stepped frequency microwave radio meters that measure surface winds by looking for radiation off the ocean surface. When the storm gets close to land, ground-based NextRad Doppler radars 
give us close up and complete view of the wind field. Here's something to consider. The maximum sustained winds are the strongest winds found anywhere in the storm, and the winds are usually a little stronger out over the water where they're free from things like trees and buildings, which can slow it down. Just because reporting stations or buoys aren't showing the highest winds, doesn't mean they aren't happening. And as we approach the anniversary of 1999's Hurricane Floyd this week, we continue our series looking back at the disastrous storm. Floyd caused catastrophic flooding and significant damage across the eastern United States, particularly in North Carolina and here in Virginia. So much so that our team here at 13 News Now did an hour-long special recapping the destruction. Let's take a look at part five of the 1999 special, Fury and Floods, with former anchor Barbara Sierra and former chief meteorologist Jeff Lawson. Welcome back to this 13 News special report on Floyd's fury and floods. So far, the damage we've been showing you for the most part tonight has been from Floyd, but Floyd didn't act alone. That's right, a co-conspirator named Dennis, storm systems, and even tornadoes that followed rolled out the welcome mat from the Outer Banks to Hampton. and stuff like that blowing off, so had cut power. We're staying, we're staying, we're just going down the road to another motel. Ain't no way we're leaving now. It's, well, it's high tide now, so um, it's really coming over. I haven't been down here when it's been quite like this. It's, uh, well, it's a menace, going out and then coming back again. Been through other storms, but uh, this one's probably done the most damage in this area since I, we've owned the house about five years. Went about, about 1.30 this morning, started cracking. I thought it would hang in here a little while longer, I really did. Uh, I was surprised it went. The house is rocking, the, the wind's blowing it around. It's a little hard to sleep because the house is like moving around and it's still doing it. We weren't expecting the wind to come in quite as heavy, quite as fast. Yeah, we didn't expect it. I mean, it was nice and calm and big and glassy yesterday and uh, now we come out today and it's, it's out of control. When people think today's not a good day for fishing, they're wrong. They're wrong. It's pretty windy. It's not really as as big a waves as I thought it was going to be. What is the sand doing to you? Does it hurt? It hurts. Things wet? Yeah. yeah. But we're alive, so that's all that matters, isn't it, in the end? Our building, Room 7, and they told us it would be two weeks before we could, probably be two weeks before we could move back in. Our first hurricane, Dennis, certainly did some damage, but what made it such a problem when Floyd came through? Well, it was simply the proximity of one storm to the other. As Dennis came through, it sort of set the stage for what would happen with Floyd. During the summer, while most of the state was in the worst drought since the Dust Bowl years of the 1930s, Hampton Roads, while not in as serious a situation, was also running at a deficit for the year in terms of the amount of expected rainfall. That all began to change, though, about the middle part of August. 
August 13th to be exact, we had 26.51 inches of rain for the entire year of 1999. That was about two and a third inches below normal. And then the rains began to come. This is before Dennis, remember. By the end of the month, on the 29th, we had 30.26 inches of rain. That was less than an inch below normal, so we had made up quite a bit of ground, and we were very thankful at that time for the needed rainfall. And then Dennis struck. Not a lot, well, not as much rain at Norfolk International, but still a lot, 3.84 inches. Portsmouth over 7 inches, and Elizabeth City also over 7 inches of rain. And then the week between Dennis and Floyd, Norfolk International, 2.39 inches was one of the lowest amounts around. Virginia Beach, 8 inches of rainfall in that three-day period. Parts of the peninsula around Hampton and Newport News also had between 6 and 8 inches of rain. So it was all that tremendous rainfall that had occurred in the previous month that had saturated the ground and set the stage for the extreme rains and the extreme flooding that we saw from Floyd. Well, that gives you some perspective on why Floyd was so devastating. You simply can't fight the laws of Mother Nature. But once the damage is done, how does the community start piecing it back together? Coming up, we'll show you exactly what it takes to put it all back together again. And we'll have a walking tour of downtown Franklin with the mayor and hear about his vision for revitalizing the downtown. Stick around. Tropical Trivia is on the other side of the break. Welcome back. Tonight's tropical trivia question is, what year did the U.S. Weather Bureau, what the NWS was called before it was switched to NWS, switch to using men's names as well as women's names for tropical storms and hurricanes? Was it in 1960, 65, 72, or in 1979? I'll have the answer for you tomorrow night on Hurricane Hub Live. Remember, we are right here on 13 News Now Plus, seven days a week at 8 p.m. for the latest on the tropics. We'll see you back here tomorrow night.